Jesus has met the eleven on the Mount of Olives. This is his final appearance, and he is going to ascend to his Father. Luke tells us, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Tonight, uh, our message is on the fact of his coming. Some of you are old enough to remember those episodes of Dragnet, both on television and even before that on radio, when at least in one, seg one time each segment, Sergeant Joe Friday would often say to the one he was interviewing, just give me the facts. Just give me the facts. Well, now that may sound all right to many in our modernistic age, and it may well be the kind of thing that we would normally associate with that ruling of a empir empiricism that is so common in our day, but it's too simplistic. And I think sometimes our titles need to be looked at carefully because we may be too simplistic as well. What do we mean? by facts. Well, in the first place, facts and events are identical as one looks at history. Facts are events. But as uh, Arthur Holmes, uh, the great uh, professor over here at Wheaton College indicates, facts need to be defined. For you see, facts, when we look at them metaphysically, is an objective state of affairs that pertains to a given time and place and in a given set of circumstances and relationships. And that is independent whether any of us know it or acknowledge it or not. Epistemologically, a fact or event is a fact of experience. It's related to the whole complex flux of inner and outer experience of which it is a part. The facts we know, then, are not bare, bare facts clothed in the birthday suit of metaphysical objectivity, but they are interpre-facts. That is, they're perceived and they're understood by a human person who clothes them in the habits of human experience and human perspective. But the question I think we have to ask ourselves, can any future event or fact be factual? Doesn't fact depend upon occurrence in reality? Can the basis of fact, therefore, be something other than occurrence already in reality? Can it be linked with faith? In fact, every factual reference to Jesus' first coming was really based upon faith or at least based upon the trustworthiness of the one who was promising or the trustworthiness of that which is promised. In every case, that trustworthiness stands firm, and that which is promised is consistent with all the other promises of God. For example, back in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, a son was promised. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the Son came. For Paul says in Galatians 4, For in the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law. Or 
a vicarious death was promised when Jesus was straightening out his disciples as to who was greatest he points to himself and he says the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many and that vicarious death occurred not many months after that when Jesus went to the cross and there in the agony that he poured out for us in the death that he died in our behalf he cried out as we read in the 19th chapter of John it is finished and the finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross vicarious and substitutionary was actually done for us it was a fact and it's a fact that is important to our faith a resurrection was promised Jesus himself had said there in the city of Jerusalem destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again and his disciples after his resurrection realized that he was talking about the temple of his body not that physical temple in which they were residing at that particular time and again and again and again both in the Gospels and in the book of Acts the resurrection of Jesus is clearly portrayed as factual this actually happened but it had been promised the empowering of the Spirit had been promised and we read that here in our text tonight in verse 8 you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth and then it's in that context that as they gaze into heaven these two men dressed in white these angelic beings as we normally think of them spoke to them and said why are you doing this? Don't you know that this same Jesus will come in like manner as you've seen him go? And then on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came. And it not only empowered them, but Peter himself indicated that this was the fulfillment of what God had spoken through Joel the prophet. I will pour my Spirit out upon all flesh, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men and I know what he means by that. Your old men shall dream dreams. You see, facts in God's economy are tied closely to faith in his trustworthiness and in his veracity. And in the same way, we understand what these men are saying there on the Mount of Olives. This Jesus will come. This same Jesus will come. And they were linking that with the faith that they had and with the promise that had been made by God that this too will occur just as those many other promises were fulfilled and did occur. So we often look at the biblical revelation and we see the facts that are presented, the events that are presented in that biblical found revelation and we recognize that this is not mere faith, it's not credulity and certainly it's not something merely to arouse feeling but sometimes faith biblical faith and fact tend to interpenetrate each other we believe this will happen that's our faith and it does happen fact it can be checked out it can be verified or we believe that God has said this and promised this and will do this and eventually God will actually produce what he has promised. Faith and fact are always interrelated in this way in the biblical revelation. But really that's the way humans interpret reality. The scientist begins with an hypothesis. He begins with faith. Often this hypothesis is based upon the implication of other facts that he knows in relationship to what he's attempting to find out and such faith is not credulity it doesn't fly in the facts in, in the face of facts already known sometimes a whole new paradigm remember Thomas Kuhn has to be developed if our facts are to be expanded and if the unknown facts are to become known and with, when such hypotheses or paradigms are tested and found to be true, not merely believed at this particular point, but found to be true, sometimes what we thought was factual has to be modified. Oftentimes it has to be scrapped. Not many of us still believe in a flat earth. 
or the Ptolemaic theory, the earth-centered theory of the cosmology. You see, facts came in, and those previous facts had to be scrapped. And our understanding is broadened as these various explanations are given. So the difference then in the facts about reality and the biblical facts yet to be experienced is that these biblical facts which are yet to be experienced and certainly the coming of Christ falls into that category are revealed by the creator redeemer God who sees all things as eternally present and is not bound even though he must reveal himself to creatures who are human beings and therefore time bound and since he is not bound, he can speak solidly and solely with authority and what he promises will take place. These facts that he speaks of, he promises, will occur surely as other facts or other events have occurred in the past. And here we understand what humans refer to when we talk about a future event or a future fact. From God's perspective, they occur. He knows their reality. He reveals them as genuinely factual. Now, in light of this brief excursion into biblical philosophy, let me say three things about the fact of Christ's second coming. First, the facticity of the second coming of Christ is integrally related to the veracity of God and his Son. Amen. Realities that is, facts or events, become reality because of the veracity of the Creator God. He has created all things. He knows all things. Therefore, in His revelation to us, who are sinful and certainly are less than wise in so many ways, He makes known what is to be. When Joseph, who is spoken of in the book of Genesis, looked at himself there as a slave boy in Egypt, he could have despaired as he faced his situation. But in God's providence, as the story unfolds, he becomes second to the favor of Egypt. And as we read there in the 50th chapter of that story in, in the book of Genesis, Jacob is dead and Joseph's brothers are afraid that Joseph, after all these years, may still hold a grudge and pay back in full all their wrongs, Scripture says. And so they go to Joseph, and they ask forgiveness, and they ask forgiveness on the basis of what their father had desired. And they come to him, and they weep, and they ask to be only his servants, only his slaves. And then Joseph said, Do not be afraid. Am I in God's place? As for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And that's the nature of God's providence. And you see it throughout the Old Testament, what God does with Moses and what God does with King David and what God does in that nation and what God has to do in order to judge his people and bring them back to a recognition of his greatness and his power. All of this is spelled out. It's a rather tragic story, but it's a story that is a part of that narrative of revelation which we find there in the Old Testament. And you see, it's all based upon the veracity of God. Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.13? And if you remember, this is in that context where Paul is speaking of many trustworthy statements, and you'll find those statements scattered throughout the pastorals. And he says here, if we are faithless... He remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. You see, his truth and his veracity are his very nature. Amen. And that's what we've seen in his revelation to us that we find within the Bible. Or again, in Titus 1.8, where Titus speaks of every Christian having a hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised ages ago. Or Hebrews 6, and here, of course, the wider context is that this is written to those who were in the possible peril of falling away. And in doing so, the Hebrew writer points out how God's faithfulness was seen in connection with Abraham and how he gave promise to Abraham and sealed that promise with the veracity of himself. And he says this, 
under inspiration, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. But what we say about the living God, we must also ascribe to the living word. That word made flesh, dwelling among us. He was, as John notes in that great prologue, full of grace and truth. He himself said that he knew what the truth was and that he himself was that truth and that the word was to be the sanctifying power of truth for their, that is, the disciples' very lives. He often spoke as God would speak. Truly, truly I say to you. And constantly he is setting forth his own understanding as over against that of the Old Testament. And we see this in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, You have heard it said by those of old thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, He that is angry with his brother without a cause has already committed murder in his heart. You see, Jesus, this living word who has become flesh, speaks with the same veracity, with the same truthfulness, gives the same kind of revelation that Father God has given. And he speaks for his Father, as he frequently says. And this one who is the incarnate truth promised that he would come again. He promised his coming at the time that he that Peter made that great confession. Remember there in Matthew 16? And after he has seen that perhaps they're ready now to understand something of his death and resurrection, even though that was mistaken, he was mistaken at least as far as Peter was concerned, he then goes on to talk about uh, winning the whole world and losing one soul, and in the process he talks about coming with the Father and with the holy angels and in glory. He also spoke of his coming at a time when there was great pride expressed by his disciples in that magnificent temple that Herod had been refurbishing, lo, those many, many years. And as they walk out of that temple, as we read there in the beginning verses of what we often refer to as the little apocalypse in the Gospels, he hears his disciples saying, look at this magnificent building and look at these great stones. Is anything comparable to that? And as they stop to rest there on Mount of Olives, this is often called the Olivet Discourse, he says to them, I tell you, there'll not be one of those stones left upon another. And, and they wonder, what's he talking about? And they ask the question, when will this happen? When will this occur? What's the sign of your coming? and of the end of the world. And there, even though we may not know how to interpret all of that little apocalypse, Jesus certainly shares with them that they will see that great terrible time come upon Israel in the days of the Romans, and this temple will be destroyed. But he also links that with his own coming at the end of the age, for he says, don't believe every Messiah who may show up. Remember, I will come, but I'll come and every eye shall see me, and all will know that I have come back for that second time. And then again, Jesus tells of his coming at a time of deep discouragement. He had eaten the last meal with his disciples. He had accused one of those disciples of betraying him. He had uh, spoken to them about uh, who ought to be great and compared that to the way the Gentiles looked upon greatness. And finally, finally, he makes that statement that we often hear at funeral time. Let not your hearts be troubled, he says. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I will come to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus, who speaks in the same way that the Father speaks, who speaks with his veracity and his truth undiminished, Jesus speaks of his coming again. And when he was standing before those uh, who were judging him, the Sanhedrin, he speaks there of his coming. Turn, if you will, to the 26th, 27th chapter of Matthew. Matthew. 
Oh, in the 26th chapter, I'm sorry, 64, verse 64. Here, the, the, the great, uh, the high priest has charged him under oath by the living God that he, he ought to confess that he's the Christ, the Son of God. If he does, then, of course, that's the only charge they need. And Jesus replies, yes, it is as you say, but I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Amen. You see, Jesus in his life and ministry was not above doing what his father had done, telling about his coming, promising his coming, and saying this indeed is to be understood as a fact, and it must be believed because I've promised it, and I cannot lie even as my father cannot lie. And so when that announcement of this great event took place, as it does, as we read here in the first chapter of Acts, then certainly it is eventful. It carries with it a number of combined facts. Not only will Jesus return, but it's the same Jesus. There's an identity there that we have to always emphasize. He'll come in like manner. He'll come visibly. He'll come in the clouds. He'll be seen by all. And the final event which will then take place is the coming of Jesus for his own. It's in the veracity of God and his Son that we believe that these promised facts will become occurring facts in the future. But secondly, the facticity of his coming is also integrally related to the expectancy of the early church. Amen. The church was, and it ought to be, because it is, the eschatological community. They are constantly, that is those who make up the church, if we understand scripture right, are constantly looking forward to his coming. Even when they break bread together each Lord's Day around this table. Paul says, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yeah. And it is in understanding that, that we must also understand the fact of his coming. Because you see, the church confessed that in Christ's first coming, as the Hebrew writer tells us, he was offered to bear the sins for many. But he shall appear, the church also confessed the second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Amen. Now sadly the church today has put its roots down too deeply in the present world and little thought is given to the future. And yet the church, if we are to understand the church as being that institution which Jesus himself created by his precious blood must always live simply and eagerly await his coming. Look at that first letter. Let me take a little time. The first letter of the Philippians. Excuse me. The first letter to the Thessalonians. <laughs> uh, if, if you've read this letter recently, you know that it not only says something about the Lord's coming, it has a great deal to say about the pastoral relationship that Paul had with these brethren here in Thessalonica. And it's quite interesting that at the conclusion of each section of the book, and we've divided these sections into chapters and verses, but at the end, end of each section Paul emphasizes the event of Christ's second coming and the proper attitude that the church ought to have toward that. Look at uh, the first section, verse 10, chapter 1. And Paul here, if you note the other eight or nine verses preceding this, is referring to himself and these Thessalonians and how they had turned from God, uh, from, from idols to the living God, to serve the one true God. And he says then in verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Or down in the second chapter, at the conclusion of that second series of uh, material, in verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope? Paul's been talking about his relationship with the Thessalonian Christians, his longing to see them and why he was 
kept from doing that. And then he says, for what is our hope or our joy or our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Or turn to the third chapter, verses 11 and 12. Here he's talking about sending Timothy and getting word from Timothy that they're doing well. And uh, that report has gladdened his heart. And so he comes to the conclusion of that section saying this as we read there in verses 11 and 12. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. And may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Or the fourth chapter. And this passage is known to all of us because we quote it frequently beginning there in verse 13. And here he's talking about the fact that he had not been there long enough to tell them all that they needed to know about this event which was yet to be in the future and all the ramifications of it. And so he says there in verse 13, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And that's the gospel. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's own word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise, rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And you would think, well, maybe Paul's finished. But we come to that fifth chapter, which is filled with all of those very, very practical exhortations. And of course, this is that chapter that uh, some of our friends use uh, to emphasize uh, the tripart nature of man and the fact that uh, uh, holiness or consecration or sanctification ought to be done wholly, that is, every bit of man, his spirit and soul and body ought to be transformed. It's not a proof text for that as, as much as that helps us in our theologizing about some of those events. But look at verse 23. After all of that has been said, may God himself, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. Why? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Now that's the nature that we find the church having in the New Testament. It was an eschatological church. And if we follow the New Testament as we claim we do, we will again have to recognize that we are an eschatological community and we are eagerly awaiting, we must eagerly await the coming of Jesus Christ in that great day when he shall appear. Amen. And he shall catch us up to meet him in the air. I've not had any problem with rapture. In fact, I understand that that's a Latin term, which means the same thing as Greek, to catch up. And, it believe, and I believe that Jesus will rapture us at the end of the age. And this will be a part, this will be one of those essential parts of, of his coming. Well, third, finally, the facticity of Christ's second coming is also intricately related to the end of all things. God's way of bringing an end to human history. Toward the end of that apostolic period when the church had been in existence 35 to 40 years, Peter wrote about scoffers who were snidely remarking, where is the promise of his coming? All things are just as they've always been. Death comes to all. Everything remains as it has always been. 
And how often have you heard the scoffer of our day, the naturalist, the materialist of our day, talk about an evolutionary process and speak about total materiality and think of life occurring by chance and time over billions of years. And yet, what Peter does, he reminds those scoffers, those mockers, that there was a world that once existed, but it was destroyed by water back in the days of Noah. But he said, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. And that fire of judgment would not only destroy ungodly men and send them, as we read in the sixth chapter of Revelation, running for the rocks and the mountains and crying that they may hide them from the conquering lamb. But Peter also points out that the reason that we may give from a human perspective as to why God has not settled all things and brought all things to an end in the coming of his son is that he operates on a different timetable than we do. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. And then Peter says, it may be that his patience is the reason for what humanly appears to be delay. But this is only because God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But he goes on to say that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and the heavens and earth, the elements, will disintegrate with a great roar. And he asks that question, which I think is an important question, right in the midst of all of those end-time truths. How ought we, we then, to live? We ought to look, he says, for that new heaven and that new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen. You see, in God's good time, and that's what's emphasized here by Jesus as he talks to his disciples there on the Mount of Olives just shortly before ascending. In God's good time, he will bring all things to an end. He will send his own son whom heaven must receive and he will judge all things and bring an end to this earthly sphere. The question which I think Peter was posing there, are we ready? Have we been working toward that end? Are we truly that kind of eschatological community that can actually believe, believe that the fact of his coming will bring an end to all things. Paul spells this out as well in that great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. Amen. Among other things, he affirms that as Christ was raised, so we too shall be raised. Christ is the first fruits, then we who are his at his coming. And at that time, as he goes on in that same letter, that same chapter, at the same time, he will subject, all things will be subjected to him, except, of course, the Father. And even he will abolish the last enemy, which is death. He will defeat him. And then the end will come, and he'll deliver up the kingdom to God the Father when he has abolished all rule and all power. And he gathers his own. Note there in the closing verses of that great chapter, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Compare that with that passage of Paul's over in the, the first Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 13. He turns the kingdom over. In other words, all of the blood-bought, blood-washed ones have been turned over to the Father. And judgment comes to all those who are unsaved. You see... This is the way God brings an end to human history. And he does so in this dramatic fashion of sending his own son and bringing new heavens and new earth out of that experience as the old earth melts with fervent heat. And as we look toward that day, we ought to recognize how we ought to live as those people who are eagerly awaiting his coming. But all of this, all of this, we accept by faith. In fact, all future events promised by God are based upon faith. Amen. But it's not credulity. Behind it lies the experience of the prophets and the apostles. One of those apostles, Peter, said we have a more sure word of prophecy. And if you look at the context and ask why, because they were with him. They saw him. Peter particularly says, I was with him on the holy mount. And I heard the voice 
from majesty saying, This is my beloved son. I believed in him. I followed him. I accepted those promises that he gave. And I do believe that the promises which are out there in the future are indeed going to occur. Amen. And the fact of his coming will be a reality in his own time. You see, biblical faith is reliable. Look at that uh, chapter in Hebrews 11 on faith. Begins with uh, what we say is not a very good definition of faith, but I think it is. Now faith, and I'm quoting from the King James, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the word that's translated substance there is the Greek word hypostasis. There wasn't much that they could compare it to and get anything other than just that, substance. That's how the Cappadocian fathers were using that particular noun as they talked about uh, how God can be one, substance, and yet at the same time have three personalities, can be three in one. But years later, when they began uncovering the papyra in Egypt, about the turn of, the, of this century, they found a, a clay jar with a couple pieces of paper in it and they tried to reconstruct the, the story that, lied, that lay behind it. Apparently this woman was writing her governor and she was seeking redress. Someone had taken a piece of property from her and yet it was hers. And she wanted the governor to not only step in and give him and give her her proper property, but she wanted him to know that it was hers. And so she penned this letter and told the whole story in this letter and then she enclosed another document. She put it in this clay cylinder, gave it to her servant. Her servant went off to the provincial palace and while he was on his way he stopped overnight at a small village that was raided by raiders and robbers and ruffians and they killed everybody took everything that was of value as they thought and they saw that clay cylinder with two pieces of paper in it they threw it aside it was covered up by rubble later uncovered hundreds and hundreds of years later and the whole situation could could be reconstructed by reading those those two pieces of paper and what this woman had done was not only write the letter but she had enclosed in that letter her title deed the piece of property that had been taken from her sure it was taken nine, ten, nine, nine tenths of the law possession is nine tenths of the law we say but it still remained hers because she had the title deed of it and she wanted quick redress from the governor. Now, if that's, and, and, and when she talked about the title deed, she used this same Greek word, hypostasis. Now put that back into the, into the, in the translation. Faith is the title deed of the future. Faith is a title deed of the future. It's not only solidly based upon the facts and events of the past, the death and resurrection of Jesus, his promised return, but it's the title deed of the future. We know if we've identified with him, if we're associated with him, if we're part of the church, which is his body, we know that the future is ours. And we are assured because faith is that title deed of the future. We are assured of the fact of his coming. And so we need to pray, even as those did, as we come to the close of the Bible, even so... Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.